started. All right, well, hey, everyone, uh, welcome. It's uh, 3.04 p.m. on March 18th, 20, uh, 2021. This is the regularly scheduled meeting of the Atherton SBDM Council. I just shared the agenda link uh, in the chat. Um, Uh, if you would pull up the February 18th uh, minutes, I can I can also uh, I will also hyperlink the March 11th minutes in there as well. I realize that they they aren't linked. We'll review minutes from our last two meetings. Uh, in the March 11th minutes, the ones that I'm hyperlinking in there right now, and I'll go ahead and put them in the chat since I'm a little late on that. Uh, that was our big budget meeting last week where we talked about the operational budget and talked about a few significant expenditures that uh, are not reflected in the budget we'll review this month, but it'll be reflected next month because they're March expenditures. Are there any questions or comments or feedback on the review of the minutes? Anybody want more time? Then uh, if everyone's ready, is there a motion to approve the minutes for February and March? A motion, motion to approve the minutes. Thank you. It sounded like there were two of them. So yeah, motion one, sorry. motion two. Uh, do we have any uh, further questions or comments? for consensus. Does this sound like we have consensus then on approving the minutes as, as they are provided? All right, uh, let's see. I'm gonna close out that window and let's look at uh, review racial equity analysis protocol. Let's see whose turn it is. I think Mr. Stutz read them last week, if I remember, is that right? Ms. Swanson, did you read them? You did, okay. Uh, then, uh, Ms. Ull, are you here? Can you, uh, are you in a position to be able to read? I'm driving. I'm not going to be able to read them. No problem. Ms. Anderson, would you like to be the one to read our racial equity assessment protocol? Well, let me get it pulled up here. Hold on just a second. Heck, I had to join on my phone, so I'm a little discombobulated. Well, well, don't worry about that then. Let we can we can okay. circle back to you another time, Mr. Okay, Davis. Thanks. Yeah, no problem, Mr. Davis. Are you? Would you be okay to read them? I think he's joining by iPhone as well. I'm happy to do so, Doctor Abley. If, I, if well, we we typically kind of we've been going through alphabetically, okay. um, so I want to give everyone the the chance. Uh, Mr. Smith. Yes, sir. I can, I can do that. Absolutely. Excellent. Thank you. Yes. So number one, what is the overarching purpose of the policy procedure or practice? Number two, which racial gender or other groups could be inequitably inequitably affected by this policy procedure or practice and how number three, which racial gender or other groups will have the most concerns with this policy procedure or practice and why? Number four, what unintended consequences could result from the policy, procedure, or practice such as racial or gender inequities? Number five, have stakeholders, particularly those most impacted by the decision, been meaningfully informed or involved in the discussion of the policy, procedure, or practice? What was the feedback? Number six, what factors may be producing or perpetuating in inequities associated with this issue? 
Does this policy, procedure, or practice deepen these iniquities or improve them? Number seven, is the policy, procedures, or practice resourced to guarantee full implementation and monitoring? Number eight, who, such as an individual or group, is the main driver for improving equity for this particular policy, procedure, or practice? Thank you, sir. Um, there, uh, there are no guests uh, with us that uh, would have signed in for individuals wishing to address council, but I'll give a moment in case any wanted, anybody were wanting to speak for three minutes. Anybody wants to identify themselves as an individual wishing to address council? Okay, um, so uh, new business. So we, we talked about the operational budget last week. Um, this, uh, this week, uh, the, some of the budget talk uh, is something really important and that's our, our academy budget, which is funded through the state um, through something we call Perkins funding. Um, there's additional funding at, at the district level through the academies of Louisville, which is a separate pool of money. Um, but I asked uh, Kyle Chandler, our academy coach, uh, to present the uh, Perkins funding budget for our academy. Kyle, I'll make you a, a, a co-host co so you can do your part. All right. Hey, everybody. Thanks for having me uh, this afternoon. As Dr. Averly mentioned, uh, I'm the new academy coach at Atherton this year. And uh, recently had the privilege of working through this uh, uh, initial budget application process with the CTE teachers and staff here at Atherton and wanted to uh, give you guys a update on uh, what we had come up with. Hopefully you guys will be able to see. We see you. All right. Uh, all right. Uh, so as Dr. Abley mentioned, uh, you know, the this particular bucket of, of funds, uh, you know, is diverted to uh, the state from a federal grant. Uh, they give a lot of money every year to career and technical education. Uh, and in order to uh, be eligible for that, uh, the districts and then states have to fill out uh, applications uh, and, and grant information in order to get that on our behalf. So the work really starts with, and I can't say enough about uh, these individual teachers in these career and technical education classrooms. They are the experts in their field. Uh, they are the ones that know their curriculum, their needs, and they go out and they do much of this legwork. Uh, so my role is to help support and facilitate that and make sure that they get what they need with the help of Dr. Averly and, and you guys. So uh, the CTE teachers assess their needs and ensure students have access to the tools required to learn their content. During that application process, the teachers go gather estimated costs to submit to the district. JCPS will submit a combined application for all funds, uh, uh, for all, sorry, all JCPS CTE teachers in the spring for the following year. And that's where we are now. So we've had the introductory kind of spring um, uh, planning session, we'll say, uh, you know, what are our needs? What are our wants? Uh, what, what can we get in the hands of students for the fall? We won't actually order anything until the fall. Uh, so this is just an initial kind of ask and gives them an idea of what our needs are. In the fall, again, the schools are given actual budgets to follow. And at that time, quotes from the vendors are collected in order to get those. Um, so this was what we came up with this year collectively, or I should say what those CTE teachers came up uh, with as needs. Uh, this is, uh, these are the different pathways that we offer. And so as you guys know, we have the academies of Louisville here at Atherton. And within those academies, we have career pathways. Uh, so for example, for aerospace engineering, aircraft maintenance technician, and I, I, I alphabetize these, but um, also electrical and electronics engineering, you have our uh, three pathways within the engineering academy. And so these are the different um, items that they've denoted that they'll need in total uh, for the coming school year in the fall. Some of that has to do with the fact that they as part of a four course sequence uh, for, for students to earn uh, their completer status, right, in that pathway. So for them to uh, say that they've graduated and taken all courses required to learn that skill, uh, they 
are we are now in Atherton at the point where we're adding some of our final some of our fourth courses. So you'll see that through some of these is uh, that's where some of the money is. And then, as you see here, the total requested from Perkins was, as Dr. Averly mentioned in the agenda, $38,470. So the district, uh, as well as we know, that that number will fluctuate somewhat between now and fall uh, as we get hard quotes and numbers from vendors. And we really uh, uh, hone in on, on those needs uh, you know, at that time. But that's currently uh, where we sit with that. And we wanted to bring it to you today and kind of let you know where we were in that process, so we'll submit that. Uh, the intention is to submit that to uh, the district uh, tomorrow, and then we'll uh, get feedback from them and see if there's anything that we need to to tweak or adjust as well. So, anybody have any questions? I can try to help answer for that. I'll, I'll warn you, this is my first rodeo, but I'm happy to try or look into it for you if I can. All right, well, Dr. Abel, back over to you. All right, yeah, thank you. Uh, you know, it's um, uh, the thirty-eight thousand is uh, is the is probably going to be close to normally what we get, give or take a, a few thousand every year to support our academies, and we've been very blessed to be in a position to support a lot of major programs in our school. But eventually, as as this surplus of funds dries up. Uh, uh, and we start tightening up our belt, um, having a, a good system for how we manage our operational budget, including how we're supporting our uh, these these types of programs that are very cost intensive uh, is going to be very important. So, um, you know, Kyle and and we all are very fortunate to kind of be in a position right now to be throwing money where it's needed and. Uh, uh, it's a good time to kind of be learning what we have, where it's coming from, and what it's for, and then make sure that uh, we, we establish good procedures in place so that it'll endure into the future. So thank you, Kyle. And I know I've been part of your PLCs. You meet, you meet pretty much every week with the, uh, the CTE teachers for each of those academies and making sure that we have, you know, our mission, vision, goals, but also are um, the, uh, uh, the industry certifications and the programs and, uh, and curriculum and knowing uh, what type of staffing needs we're having, which I'm gonna mention actually here in a little bit when we get down to staffing on from an academy standpoint that we, we know we're gonna have a need here uh, for next year. So thank okay. you, sir. All right, uh, let's see. Uh, school mascot committee update. Um, let's see, da, 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 da. Um, so the, the main thing I guess I wanted to mention, I've already put it in the agenda, is uh, we are meeting with all the Atherton head coaches, we being uh, myself and uh, three teachers who are Atherton alumni as well, who are really leading this mascot committee. I'm kind of just a, I'm a, I'm, I'm fortunate to be able to just uh, be a participant in these meetings and uh, and contribute my, my, my knowledge as a principal, but I really want this to be driven by our alumni. Um, so we'll be meeting with the head coaches uh, it, with the intent of uh, uh, seeing if we're what type of direction we're we're at with regards to progress on the school mascot. You know, I had what I uh, what I was hoping would be an ambitious goal of maybe having a solution by the end of March. Um, some of that got put on the back burner with all the return to school action that's been taking place over the last several weeks. Um, so uh, definitely, uh, I feel very confident by the end of this year, we'll be coming before you all um, with a fairly well vetted um, recommendation that uh, isn't that will be shared with our community in multiple ways um, uh, to get feedback on on uh, some things that we're learning and, and as that idea develops. Um, I'm, I'm being very vague because I don't want to imply that we have a certain solution. In fact, we're still we're still kind of like it, uh, looking at it from a standpoint of uh, you know our. Are our students more interested in your traditional pick an animal from a zoo, or are we wanting to go more non-traditional and abstract? 
Um, we're, we're running those, what we've learned through those discussions with our coaches as well. And uh, then we'll be bringing that back to the larger committee, which includes alumni from the past. Um, but uh, the SPDM will be a critical part in ultimately helping, uh, I guess, be part of the process from beginning to end. You are the first group and you'll be the last focus. You are the first focus group and you'll be the last one ultimately. Um, in our uh, in the in the decision making process, and then the promotion and support of that. So, I guess that's that's as much as I'm ready to to say as far as uh, as far as the mascot's concerned. But I'll pause in case there's a question or in case I was vague to explain that in a too weird of a way. I have two questions. Yeah. So when I read the agenda, I thought we were we would be hearing from the committee today about their meeting with the coaches, but that the mascot committee is meeting with the head coaches today. Yeah, um, we were supposed to meet with them last week, and that all got tabled. Um, the we had the vaccinate. Well, no, 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 sorry, it got tabled the first time we were supposed to meet with them. We had vaccinations, and it pushed it back a week, and then after that, we had the whole return to school explosion of action and so it got pushed back to, to today um and then my second question was so you mentioned working with students to see if they want more like a actual tangible animal or thing was that in the survey that students received or did they do a separate focus group like with where they met with students and discussed that because i didn't get that impression from the last report we got. Right, um, it has to do with our last, the last student focus group that we met with. Actually, um, Damon, I believe, were you part of that uh, a couple Fridays ago where with Mr. Tucker and Miss Thunder and we were talking about, were you not uh, part of that? I, I don't remember the date that we did it, but I was a part of the focus group. I was part of the first focus group with, um, the different student leaders. And then we also did a focus group specifically with um, BSU officers and Mr. Tucker. And was that the one, I'm, I'm sorry, it's all blurring together. That's why I'm kind of calling on you for help. Was that the one where we started talking about a potential for uh, a, a, a cat, a, a feline, you know, a cat, a panther or a raptor or an eagle or something like talking through the different types of animals? Yeah. that. Um, as we've been meeting with the focus groups, um, uh, Ms. Lucia, we've we've been we were hearing more of a, a and at least a strong consideration for a traditional type of mascot, an animal of some sort. Um, you know, we had I think at the last SPDM meeting we talked about a phoenix, which you know is a mythical type of creature, but and more animal like, but. Uh, it, it through the progress of our student groups, we wanted to make sure not to discount a traditional type of animal as well. So, so that that's going to be presented. Uh, that general discussion is going to be presented with our head coaches of all our sports that can participate this afternoon or this evening, and then we'll be going back to the committee and say, all right, what have we learned through all these focus groups, and what will our next steps be? But I, I can tell you, we're not we're not there where we're where we're just a meeting or two away from a recommendation. Um, but we are we are getting close, I think, to be pushing out. Here are some more solid ideas, and we want some very concrete feedback on on exact mascots, as opposed to like, what do you think of when you think of knowledgeable or think of courageous, that kind of stuff. Dr. Averly, I do have one question about the same uh, process. Uh, after the recommendation has been made by the by the committee, and then our our group has reviewed it, and we make our recommendation, uh, does this require board approval as kind of a final final stopping point along the along the way? Not uh, the, the the exact answer is no. Uh, the the more concise answer is it must be vetted through the office of of equity and diversity of diversity and equity so um whatever our proposed mascot is has to be sent to not necessarily the board but to central office to
to be vetted and endorsed or supported or at least reviewed with suggestions and feedback from a, an independent REAP analysis of the mascot selection. Very good, thank you. Okay, um, let's see, uh, and I'm not monitoring chat, so if, uh, if you are uh, trying to get my attention, somebody please make sure I know. Uh, old business, NTI update. All right, I actually have an update. Uh, I've pushed out a video over the weekend um, that took me about five hours to create and upload. I'm, I'm kind of rusty. I haven't done a video since November, as I found out. And, uh, but I really wanted it to um, convey, uh, number one, the great sacrifice of our teachers uh, in supporting a plan that would be in students' best interests. Um, because the, the going back to the drawing board was we just dump every schedule and we rerun a master schedule with, with uh, virtual and in-person classes that would align with um, the contract requirements. But that would mean every single kid's grades are archived and then somehow recovered and, and repopulated. It would also mean that uh, there is zero guarantee and in fact, a great likelihood that kids would not have the same teacher uh, over it within a 10 day period, they go from one teacher to another one, um, even in the same subject. So with the uh, uh, with a lot of discussion and and review, our our teachers endorsed a hybrid plan that puts and I'm going to say it puts the full burden of of uh, 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 of responsibility on the teacher. They're gonna be working through their planning periods. They're gonna be developing lesson plans both for in-person teaching and virtual teaching. And those are two very different ways of planning and preparing and having kids demonstrating their learning. So uh, there's a lot of responsibility put, being put on our teachers. And um, there are some, you know, the, I guess some of the, uh, the positives coming out of it is, is for the most part, we're going to have significantly smaller class sizes because only uh, a third of the students um, school-wide are coming back uh, on any given day in person and a third is remaining virtual. Um, uh, it, but that's, uh, that's just averages. Some of our classes are still fairly large uh, because the classes aren't evenly split by alphabet. You know, that's not the way the master schedule is designed by alphabet. It's just designed by total numbers. Um, but we're, uh, we're finding where those uh, situations are and making sure that we're going to, we will meet it. We're going to be ready. We are ready uh, by and large. We, can, we couldn't start on Monday, uh, but we are ready as much as we are for the start of the school year, any other year in the past. Um, you know, being uh, five days, six days away from the start of the school year, if you, if you skip spring break. Um, we're as ready as we've ever been. So, um, so our hybrid schedule, I hyperlinked it in the agenda, uh, I hyperlinked two um, schedules, the freshmen and the upperclassmen, only because uh, if you tried to put them together, it was way too complex for, for people to understand because our, our freshman students work on a different time frame because of the in-person lunch schedule and how that works. Um, our upperclassmen, are also provided and uh, I tried to keep it um, each one distinct from one another, but by and short, uh, as far as explaining how the district uh, has generally structured it, that if you're remaining virtual, then you're gonna get uh, two touch points with your teacher, just as you have been in the maroon and gold days, Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, um, uh, two touch points, you'll be doing the same thing uh, in this hybrid schedule at Atherton. And uh, if you're returning in person, you'll get two touch points, Monday, Tuesday, or Thursday, Friday. Um, and then for all students outside of those touch points, they are asynchronous uh, for the other three days or the equivalent of the three days for our virtual learning students. Um, uh, so it's, uh, it's really, I I'm gonna tell you, as an Atherton parent of a sophomore, if my son had to be quarantined for two weeks, and go into virtual learning instead of being in person, 
I feel like he's getting just a quality as education that, at virtually as he would be in person. And that was uh, that's a big deal because all our other drafts, all our other models were taking time from in person to create for virtual. And even the virtual was being cut in half from what, what it already was a very small amount of time. So for our teachers to step up and do what they have, I'm not just I'm not just like blowing smoke and trying to sound nice. Really, it was this, this was a really big deal for our teachers to step up and say they're going to do what they're going to do. Um, we're very fortunate to be um, be given the funding support to pay teachers uh, for the extra work that they are doing to finish off the school year. And uh, uh, that's, uh, as I mentioned in the agenda, it's it's running about three hundred thousand dollars when all said and done in order to for our kids to return to school in person or move to this hybrid. It's costing us about three hundred thousand in additional cost for um, staffing support uh, than if we were to just finish out the school year. So it's a big deal. Um, it's very necessary. And I'll say that on record here. I think it's very necessary for our kids to get back into school. I'll tell you as a parent as well, you know, seeing the impact, the social support impact, the social interaction. I also talk to you as a, I guess as the Atherton archery coach. You know, when I'm talking to archery kids and they're, I don't have a mask with me, but they're you know, when you're masked up, it either feels like a muzzle or it still has that sense of anonymity or, or whatever it is being screened off. But students are, you know, it's hard to get students to talk socially, right, and interact with one another. And that's something uh, I mentioned in a faculty meeting yesterday, and we'll be focusing on next week when staff do return to the building, on how do we provide a type of, you know, a scaffolded support for students and I'm not just talking about social emotional supports, which do exist as well, but also every single student and frankly, the staff as well, having been a year removed from the large type of social setting, uh, needing some, um, some guidance and again, scaffolding into how do we interact with one another again? So uh, uh, just wanted to, I guess, for that NTI update say, we have a plan. It is, uh, from my standpoint, it's a phenomenal plan for either in-person or virtual, including a movement back and forth. Um, and it's, uh, it's being supported through funding by the district, but most importantly, it's been supported by the approval and endorsement and validation by our own teachers and staff. Just pause there for a minute in case there was any question or comment regarding that. Is that 300K figure just for Atherton or is that district wide? Uh, just for Atherton for seven, for eight weeks. Oh, wow. And that's just for additional pay for teachers because they're working more hours? More hours, more preps. Um, I mean, we pretty much every way that the, 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 the teacher contract could be violated, we're violating it. <laughs> You know, aside from abusing a teacher, you know, teacher preps, teacher overages, uh, uh, the the number of hours, um, everything. It was it was, uh, and then also we need. It takes people before school and after school to do this, to do the temperature checks and the health rooms and everything. So having staff, and we extended most of our extra service before and after school. We extended to our classified staff to give them a little opportunity for that extra service pay as well. Um, there's also been some extra service pay for our um, collaboration reopening committee, the CRC, which has been a, a group of administrators and, and the JCTA representatives who've been collaborating on our reopening plans as well. Yeah, that's just for Atherton. So there's similar situations in schools our size, Atherton, Ballard, Eastern, Manual, Mail, we're all facing about the same type of cost to, to make this work. And it's not gonna be a recurring cost and it's not a cost that the school is uh, in, in, uh, enduring in any way. Anything else on our return to school? Um, I guess I would just say if if you have parents reach out to you with any return to school concerns, just uh, 
make sure they reach out to me. I mean, I put my own email into everyone's text and, and uh, uh, email just a few days ago with regards to intent to return. So I've been fielding a lot of those phone calls, um, uh, a lot of those communications myself and making sure that parents understand how it works and, you know, uh, uh, how to understand what it would look, what it will look like in April. Um, but that's it. All right, well, uh, we have a policy. It, it's been a little while. Uh, I think it was January when we did our policy reading. Um, uh, policy 602 and 603. So if, uh, if you're in the agenda, if you can pull up those, pull up that hyperlink to our bylaws and policy policies and go to 602 and 603. If you recall, we were uh, talking about how do we embed equity into these policies and uh, we kind of negotiated through the, the proper wording to make sure there's intentionality behind it. And uh, what I did is in that hyperlink, I, I, I highlighted it. Um, it's from Jan or readings from January 21, I highlighted what was added and revised in response to our discussion in January. So for policy 602, selection of instructional materials, uh, that we added a, a discussion, a, a statement about consideration of selection of school materials focusing on racial equity, implicit bias, culture, climate, and deeper learning strategies uh, included in the planning process in accordance with the school racial plan. Uh, and then a, a similar statement uh, for our professional development as well. So uh, what, where we're at is this is the second reading. If you all are okay with that for us to update policy 602 and 603 with the addition of the statement uh, that I just read. Uh, regard for our policies on instructional materials and professional development. If, if it goes through the second reading, then it would be adopted into uh, our official policy. So the only thing that's changing is we're just adding an additional sentence, right? There wasn't anything yep. deleted or reworded? Nope. Okay. Nope, just the bold part was added, that was it. Motion to approve. Seconded. I second. Great. Um, does anybody have any concerns before we come to consensus? Do we have consensus then? All right. I will add March 18th, 2021 as the second reading and adopted into policy for policy 602 and 603. Um, uh, and I've kept this on old business, but the status of the uh, alternative council model, we're expecting to get uh, feedback from the Kentucky Department of Education um, in May, uh, I believe. Oh, in April, um, when it goes before the KDE. So uh, since it's a, uh, a, since the site-based council is regulated by Kentucky Revised Statutes, this has to go before KDE for approval because that's how the statutes uh, dictate it. Uh, reports, school improvement report. Um, I'll just tell you, we've been talking since the beginning of the school year, but uh, especially since November, uh, the teachers and administrators have been talking about academic concerns as we come near the end, of, as we're as we're coming near the end of the school year, they're all the more important. Um, we've talked about classroom supports, virtual supports, the alternative course offerings uh, and course options that we have to support um, either credit recovery or um, completion uh, by students who've been struggling in this platform. Um, we're also exploring what we may be able to do through a summer school process. And I don't mean a Band-Aid, you know, two day type of summer ESS like we've traditionally done. Uh, I really don't feel like that's gonna exist uh, in, the, uh, in any 
in any way that would be valuable for our kids. Uh, so um, we want to do something that's much more intensive uh, for for uh, for our students, including in-person instruction uh, during the summer. Uh, but we're waiting. Uh, the board is making some type of plans and and discussion about what they may look like district wide. So before we're allowed to uh, submit a proposal on how to fund that. Uh, we have to await the district's response to that. And I'm hoping it's going to be more than um, what the district has called the Backpack League over the past couple summers, uh, which is very much focused on elementary school type of activities as opposed to what, what our kids really need. And that is content, subject-specific um, instruction and activities that will uh, either provide them with uh, uh, support for things that they were uh, uh, lacking through, uh, the, through this model through the past year, or provides a bridge to the next step for them. So even if they do complete Algebra 1, right, then we know that Algebra 1 did not get the 100% focus that it would have gotten in the past. So how do we bridge that for students as they're going into geometry and uh, bolster up their, um, their academic uh, foundation into the next course. So I just wanna let you know, we're, we know we're wanting to do something. We are, kind of, we are bound by what the district will let happen as well as bound by logistics. How do you move hundreds of students, right? During the summer, how do you communicate with students and figure out who wants to attend? and then provide the transportation logistics, the feeding logistics, right? The breakfast and the lunch and all that kind of stuff. What type of guidelines will we be following, health and safety guidelines that may uh, be a constraint for uh, what we're able to do in the school building. So there's still a lot of things to be done. Um, and as much as we're right now very, very busy with getting ready for April 5, we're already thinking about the summer and next school year in master schedule. I'm going to pause right there in case I've, anything I've said has stimulated a, a comment, feedback, question. Well, you know, I'm going to have a question, Dr. Abraham. You got it. <laughs> so, um, so is this going to be encouraged for students who um, like failed the class in addition to students who passed but might desire or look for enrichment is that I feel like that's what I'm hearing that's what we would like to do whether we're allowed to do that's a whole nother question but we're we're not like we're not only thinking about what do we do about all these you know we have three times as many students who are failing the class um you know this year than they were uh two years ago so how do we deal with that that is one part of it but you know our we're even thinking whole school wide how do we do something in a large scale sense so then I get you might not have the answer to this yet. So um, is it going to be like with the lessons be like planned by the district since you mentioned the backpack league or would we potentially have the autonomy to plan it for ourselves if we chose to? You're, yeah, well, you, I mean, you're, you're asking questions that require a lot more answers before we get there. But I can tell you, I'm not interested in a backpack league type of approach in our school, like predetermined lesson plan. That that would not be, in, in my mind, that would, would not serve a lot of value in our school. It would be a, a, a political ploy of, of doing something that doesn't necessarily have a lot of va academic value to it. So whatever we do would involve, um, uh, would involve our each department identifying how we would do this and to best serve our students, given whatever guidelines were provided. Okay, yeah. thank you. You're welcome. I mean, it's a good question I don't have an answer for, but uh, I can tell you, I'm not interested in wasting anybody's time, teachers or mine alike throughout the summer, if it's not gonna be significantly valuable for our students. Any other? Okay, um, 
staffing report. So I'm on uh, section seven, uh, it's supposed to be A, I think it says, I think it's, it's supposed to be B, I think it still says A on there. Uh, I don't know how to get that updated. Let me see. Let me see if I can get that corrected. There we go. Um, ECE implementation coach. It remains unfilled after having submitted the name in November. It's uh, due to a district procedure that will not allow us to fill it with the person that we've recommended because of a district procedure that says they're not going to pull a teacher out of a classroom, which I get it, I support it, except in this case, we are really being shortchanged. And um, fortunately, our counselors are stepping up um, to support one another. Uh, a particular counselor has taken on the vast burden of responsibility for those ARC chair meetings and other counselors are helping support her in that redistribution of duties. Um, but this has been a very, uh, for me, a very frustrating situation to be dealing with because we needed that person. Um, we we just uh, found out of an ECE instructional assistant uh, resignation, which leaves us with a vacancy that we will um, likely, well, we may try to fill it before the end of the school year. The transfer list comes out after spring break anyways for next school year. It would be subject to that. So we may wait for the transfer list and make a decision then. And then finally, um, uh, engineering. I mentioned that we we're, uh, we need to grow uh, by an engineering teacher uh, purely by the number of students and the number of preps that are, that are necessary to support our growing engineering program. Uh, right now, we have uh, one, two, three, four media arts teachers. Uh, we have one, two, three, four uh, health science teachers and we have one, two, uh, three um, engineering teachers. We have one math teacher who's teaching one, one engineering class. So we have three. So you just see just numerically where engineering is the one that's short right now. Um, and it's not just a, a class that, hey, I'm a math teacher. I can teach an engineering class. We need actually somebody with an aviation maintenance certification. People who actually work on airplanes and are accountable for their safe, safety flying. Um, so this isn't something that just anybody off the street could do uh, with a little mechanical experience or even engineering experience. They need this very uh, specific type of certification to support our aviation maintenance technician pathway, which is aligned and supporting our aerospace pathway uh, as well. I don't know, do you all have any questions, concerns about, about that particular position? Because I'll, I'll be advertising for it. We have the funding, uh, so it's going to be, uh, it's not going to be costing us anything. So, Mr. Smith, are you going to say something? Are the, uh, are the uh, two engineering positions, are those full-time positions? Yes. For the ECE implementation coach, are we still just waiting to get that person from before or would it be possible to repost it and re-interview we're just like stuck in limbo we are forced to wait and they were not they are not going to be filling that position for the rest of this year so uh when this school year ends then that person will be released okay yeah. so we could have them for next year we will have them for next year yeah unless they no longer desire the position but okay All right. Well, cool. Uh, I'm just going to breeze through here. I'm not going to read all these numbers. I give you all budget updates all the time, but we did spend $100,000 last month. So, you know, the, the reason I give these budget updates is we're spending a whole lot of money. When I say we, you all are part of that. Um, you know, it's not going into my pickup truck. I'll tell you that. It's going into a lot of things that uh, are supporting our school long term. Uh, we currently have available balance of just over $200,000. I hyperlinked our current XF balances as of today in there. Um, significant expenditures that have happened in the last, uh, uh, throughout February, throughout the four weeks in February, are all things that we've talked about in the past. We bought like $11,000 in calculators for our math department. 
Um, we spent several thousand dollars in radio maintenance, uh, painting of classrooms, that, uh, that building modification down there. Uh, it ran just over $7,000 uh, to have that done. They, they're wrapping that up either today or tomorrow. Um, student desks, chairs, and tables, we dropped over $50,000 uh on on us on on those items and they are uh and we're moving out bold junk um a lot of our desks are 20 plus years old and i, I told my my plan operator i don't want to see a single old desk in here anymore i'm tired of them being pushed around and traded and one of them's dangling around and they're mixed in with the brand new stuff um, we have plenty of new student desks now uh, TV monitors for the hallways. We spent about nine thousand dollars to finish off. Uh, I don't know if you all recall where we purchased a couple of them because I said I don't want to invest all this money, and then we find out they don't interface the right way. Um, so th these are the remaining monitors that we've been having discussions about for a count for a calendar year now on the monitors that are going up, big flat screen TVs that go in the hallways. Um, and scroll, you know, playing things like our Atherton on air and you know, imagery of our different academies and things like that, things to celebrate our school. Um, so you, there's a hyperlink in there that has significant expenditures. Uh, what I've asked my ordering or receiving clerk to do is she's keeping tabs on those now and she creates a little uh, uh, a Word document for me and shares it. Uh, often it's, it's small enough that I just kind of throw it into the, um, I throw it into the minutes as its own thing, but in this case, there were so many things I wanted it as a separate line item, full explanation. Um, last week, we talked about things like the floor scrubber and the hydraulic lift and the wrestling mats, if you recall, because um, I said we needed to go ahead and get the endorsement on that so we could get those purchase orders processed. I have a hyperlink in there, some of the quotes and the bids uh, on those, just so you're, so you know uh, you kind of what we're dealing with. Um, and then everything else in there, I don't think I've added anything new and I'm, I'm not trying to slide anything in there if I did, but I, I just don't remember adding anything new since uh, last month. Uh, I might've added in those last couple things under funding needs, Academy signage project of $10,000. The district does a $10,000 matching fund for Academy signage. Uh, they've come in, so we're talking about stickers on walls and posters and banners and things like that wraps on the posts in our cafeteria, things like that, that we're, we're really wanting to kind of jazz up the school, get it to look a little more modern um, and a little more uh, showcasing of the things that we have to offer. And uh, regard, uh, I don't think build, there's any new building modifications in there. Uh, again, uh, there. Uh, the something they have added, I see the bottle filler stations uh, we put in as a building modification waiting approval. They came in and retrofitted three bottle filler stations uh, that was district funded um, in response to students returning to school and not being able to use the water fountain. So one of my videos I'm going to be pushing out in the next week to our to our families is, uh, you know, bring your own bottle. Um, and uh, because we've got it's nice ice cold water coming out of the condensers of the water fountains uh, in three different locations. I'll be honest with you, I'll, I'll be speaking with you all probably over the next six months saying, I just want to replace all our water fountains. You know, they're all old. Um, most of them, they don't work properly. The condensers don't work. Com the compressor doesn't work. So the water is all lukewarm. And um, so I'd like to get us. Uh, uh, that, that to me, that's an area that really needs to be improved in our school um, when if we have the funding, which uh, I expect us to. So. Well, it's 3.53. Um, anything related to anything that's been on the agenda that you want to uh, ask about? This is also a reminder, if you ever want to add things to the agenda that are SBDM, within SBDM authority or purview, simply shoot me an email prior to the meeting and we can always add it in as necessary. Uh, Mr. Smith was asking about our April and May meetings, if they'll be in person or virtual. Um, you know, since we're gonna be in a position to be hosting things in person, uh, I feel like it's, 
it's apropos to, to have a hybrid model for our next two SBDM meetings as well. Um, so, you know, we'll, we'll be meeting in the library um, in part for those who want to attend in person, but we'll also do a Zoom, uh, continue using the Zoom link and uh, recording it uh, from that standpoint as well. Mr. Davis, I see you unmuted. Were you going to say something or? No? Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, it, it sounds like we, uh, it's 3.54 p.m. and this is the end of the regularly scheduled SBDM meeting. Um, thank you all so much. I appreciate it. I'll see you in April. Uh, thank you.